the high elves are renowned for having some of the best lore choices in the entire game. Now, most of the time we're talking about the legendary lore choices, which are exceptionally strong. Even ones like Emmerich that struggle are still very, very strong in the overall picture. But also what gets overlooked is their non-legendary lords. Because they're so easy to confederate, these often get overlooked, but there are some very, very strong builds that you can actually make from these. My name is Rado and welcome to Elven Plot Armor. This is a video series in which we will be going through each one of the lords in order of their rank and talking about some of the best builds you can make for them and how you can get the most value for your army in your campaign. This is all for campaign and based around trying to spec the characters to get the most value for your playthrough. There are three different types of lords to choose from. The Prince, the Princess and the Archmage. Now each of them has a different ability to start off with, meaning their traits. Now the trait is what they're given when you recruit them. They either have a negative trait if you have spent no influence or either 15 or 60 influence will give them a good or a great trait. Now which trait you choose will generally decide which way you decide to spec the Lord out and what type of build you will create. As we go through each of these Lords, we're going to go through, at least in my opinion and through my experience in my playthroughs, what have been some of the most potent and uh, effective as well as most enjoyable builds to use for each Lord type. Each Lord offers its own unique way of being useful on the battlefield and supporting its army. Kicking off first with the Prince, the Prince's role is to be a melee tank essentially. He has a shield which allows him to block 55% of missiles, as well as the sword making him the most preferable in a melee fight. His skills specialise in boosting his melee defence, melee attack. He's the best general for elite infantry and bolstering large beasts. Second is the Princess. The Princess is the ranged lord. She has a bow and arrow and is able to deliver ranged damage also from a dragon mount, which is also nice. Uh, when you put her on a star dragon, she is able to overcome much of her weakness in melee by being on the dragon, and also being able to be safe up in the air while she's sniping away, so very useful. The Princess's skills seem to be geared towards archery, archer-based armies, as well as unique offensive tactics like ambushing. Finally, we have the latest addition that came with the Grom and the Ponch DLC, the Archmage. She is your caster type, and while she's the most physically fragile, she has the most damage and utility out of all three of the Lords. Whilst we've gone through all the ways the Lords are different, there's also a lot of ways in which they are very, very similar. For example, when playing in campaign, you want to level them up with roughly the same priorities. So, the blue skill line, this is the campaign perk skill line, and this will let you get a lightning strike. It will also allow you to safeguard against ambushes, and after Lightning Strike is unlocked, you can also get Quartermaster or Elven Healing, which are better on Legendary and Normal difficulties respectively. Putting 3 points into Quartermaster and or Elven Healing will allow you to combine with Lightning Strike to unlock Feed and Renown to give you an additional 5% movement and increased upkeep reduction. After obtaining Lightning Strike, you can choose for your character to work through to the end of the blue tree, or you can look onto the red tree, which is a common choice for princes and princesses. Even if you only spend 4 points on being able to get 3 points in Bow Master, those are points well spent. Your Lord will have archers with them at some point, and having them fire for longer and more frequently is something that will help you. Finally, the Archmage, well, you probably guess she gets to use spells and invest points into her spells. Her journey and progression through her skills is the most unique out of all the Lords because she must generally start to prioritise those spells to get her potential to really be released. Um, I will be doing individual videos on each of the three Lord types with some of my recommended builds which show combinations of their starting trait in conjunction with different skills and the priority in which you put those skills in. So whilst many of the skills will probably look the same when you compare two Lords, level 40 and level 40, thing is, it's a long game and it takes a while to get there, the order in which you invest your points will largely dictate the playthrough that you have with those Lords. One of the ways of seeing just how similar all of the different High Elf Lords are is by looking at the skill trees. We're going to look at the Prince, the Princess and the Archmage and we're going to see just how similar they are. It's important to note that the blue line being the campaign skills and the red line being the army buff skills are virtually identical. All three lords have access to one dedication, as well as mount options, and generally the same buffs. Any lord, you want to start with Root Marcher to increase your movement range. Then the next priority is Wary to increase your ambush defense by 30%. Public order can be increased by followers when you're garrisoned. 
You can increase your trading with the leftover points if you want, and recruitment can be nice, but you don't recruit every turn, it's not that necessary. Afterwards, you will need Draft Master to get to the Almighty Lightning Strike. Level 8, this should be your first goal to get, being able to decide your engagements and separate people from their reinforcements, as well as sally out and attack one army at a time, is critically important to your campaign. Now, from here, you can decide to go to the red line, to your personal line or whatever, but this is the first stop. Now, for a prince, you would probably want to put points in Elven Healing. If you are on normal difficulty, or if you're playing on legendary, Quartermaster is probably the way to go for a prince or a princess. Once you put three points in either of those, then Fear and Renown is definitely worth it. 8% upkeep improvement, as well as plus one recruitment and 5% uh, movement range, very, very good. Once you reach Lightning Strike, you could have decided to go to the Red Tree. Regardless of your type of Lord, 3 points in Bowmaster is never wasted. You will always use Archers at some point in the game. From here, you can decide to end your connection with the Red Tree if you want, or you can continue to put points in it. Best way to spend these is to go into Skymaster to improve Dragons, because they are probably your best unit aside from Archers. And then there is a middle skill here. It's Rally for Princes, for Princesses and Archmages, this is the Lose skill. This can be improved again by putting one point into the next area. Uh, favorable Winds is usually the way to go, it increases Archers as well as the late game unit, Sister of Avalon, very very strong. You can additionally put point into Heart of the Flame if you want to improve Dragons, but Favorable Winds is usually the non-negotiable. If you want, if you're a Prince, you don't need to put one in the last spot, but if you're an Archer heavy army like you will be with a Princess, probably worth putting in Dark in the Skies. For Archmages, you will likely be wanting to prioritize as soon as you have Lightning Strike, or even before Lightning Strike, putting a couple of points into your spells. Your personal skills for your Archmages are spells and some of them can be quite deadly and even just putting one in one of your signature spells like Net of Amitok or Burning Head if you're running a Fire Mage can be very very important. Putting points in here will probably get you more yield than putting them into Bowmaster so it's quite a popular decision to get Lightning Strike first unless you're feeling very 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 bold and then prioritizing your skill tree for your spells. This is always worth building all the way up. You always have usually at least one it spell, magical reserves, earthing, and greater archaean conduits. Putting points in here will probably get you more yield than putting them into Bowmaster. All three lords can do a dedication. Dedications are one only, and selecting one will lock the other options out. There are a few standouts and they do change based on the Lord type you have. For example, Dedication to Isha, increasing your physical resistance, leadership and upkeep to spearmen, rangers and archers is very nice, especially with an additional 5% casualty. This is a great choice for a prince particularly. Princess as well. Uh, late game you might want to go for uh, Adolf and reduce your upkeep for dragons. Or even if you are an Archmage, you might choose to go for Hoeth if you would like just an extra 5 wins of magic. Last but certainly not least is the top line. This is the mounts and then personal buffs. The top line will always give you a dragon type. In the case of Prince and Princesses, you have a Sun Dragon or a Moon Dragon option. Honestly, give these both a miss and go for the Star Dragon in anyone's case. Since you're going to be riding a dragon mount, which you probably are because it is the strongest, you want to have missile resistance plus 10% because you need it. Speed of Assyrian, you can't go too wrong with that. And of course, once you're level 20, immortality is a no-brainer. Now, for Archmages, they have a few more options here and they're all very good. Greater Ward gives you 10% ward save, which is 10% against everything. Crackling Potency, two free casts of Chain Lightning, which don't use Winds of Magic. Yes, please. Absolute control. Well, you can cast more spells, without a doubt. And of course, every Lord, without a doubt, when you hit level 20, any character, get immortality. Archmages are the only Lord that do not have access to Star Dragons. They can either select a Moon or a Sun Dragon, but either of these are still excellent choices and will keep your mage safe, as well as overcome their shortcomings with physical attacks. With Lords and Princesses, trying to increase your melee defense, as well as your armor, is always a high priority. Keeping your lord alive should always be paramount. Less important but still good is melee attack, but princesses should be focused on archer-based traits. 
trying to work their way to get piercing shot and improve their armor to get volley of arrows. As your campaign goes on, you're going to find ways to be able to increase your starting lords levels. Now this will make the game start to favor castle lords a bit better because you can actually overcome that initial sucky stage where you're trying to decide between whether you want lightning strike or to actually be able to, you know, cast spells and not be terrible in combat. So there's a few ways you can do that. First of all, as you can see on the screen there, you can get dragon keeps. Each level 5 building will give you plus one to your faction's lord recruitment anywhere, anytime. This is not a short term way of being able to get high level lords, but it does add up. You'll often confederate provinces with other high level lords, and they will have a few uh, tier 5 buildings. They will often have a dragon keep there. Instant. Instant uh, extra plus one to your lord recruitment. Next up, something that you will be more easily able to control, you can get nobles with the conscientious trait. Depending on your level of difficulty, you might want to go with other traits such as emollient or frugal, based on which way you're trying to roll, but this is another really good trait and this one also will go well into the late game. Gives you plus two for every Lord Recruit. And uh, last of all, under research, once you're able to do cultural advances, which isn't too late in the campaign, you can start to move your way towards Court Advisors. This gives you a plus two to every lord you recruit, as well as handmaidens and nobles as well. So, a great piece of research, and this will all add up together. And before you know it, you won't even be seeing, but you'll notice that your lords will start recruiting around level five, level seven. Once you start getting past level 10 on your recruitment levels, you'll probably want to start considering it going for archmages more frequently, unless you see a very golden trait that just completely suits your circumstances on a prince or a princess. In summary, the most important things to take away are that all lord types are strong in different areas, particularly the combat lords are strong to begin with. The castle lords need levels to be able to get some potency. At high levels though, the combat lords really start to struggle and need the perfect combination of traits and accompanying army to be able to boost correctly to be able to get the most out of them. Most of all though, the skills are typically the same through the most part other than the personal skills and the way we level them is roughly the same. And that's it for the recap and summary of the High Elf Lords. Uh, the High Elves have some of the best Lords in the game, and all of them are useful at different parts of the game. Our next video will be looking at the number 3 pick when counting down the Lords from least best to strongest, and we will be running through some of my favourite builds to get the most out of them that you can hopefully use in your playthroughs. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, perhaps consider giving it a like or a subscribe because I'm hoping to put out plenty more content and hope you enjoy it. My name's Ben Ryder. Welcome to Elven Plot Armor and have a good one.